Welcome to Forming the Spirit Within, a teaching ministry of Pastor Brad Riley. Pastor Brad is an associate and teaching pastor at First Church of the Nazarene here in Wichita, Kansas. He is the founder and director of the Merciful Servants of Christ, as well as the author of numerous articles. And now, here's Pastor Brad. I want to begin this third week um, with, uh, again, each week I'll try and review just a little, especially since we have been off for two weeks. But I want to, I want to begin with what I told you was the key to unlocking the mystery of prayer, calling this series of classes the Unlocking the Mystery of Prayer. And so I put that right there on the top of your uh, notes there. We came to the realization last time we were together that we must realize that God heard our prayers before time began and made his plan for the world from that, from that knowledge. However, if we don't pray them, they are not there for him to hear. That's a lot to get your mind around. I'm still having It's a lot to get your mind around, okay? So I I pay close attention to the verbs, okay? I, I, God heard, I asked you the question, when did God hear your prayers? So we're saying in the past tense, God heard our prayers. To us, it sounds like past tense. God heard our prayers before all time began. But in God's life, it isn't past It's just all present because God exists outside of time and space. We have to begin there. That's where we have to begin. Who is this God that we are praying to? Who is this God that we are praying to? Who is he? How has he revealed himself to us? When we really begin to look at scripture deeply, we begin to see that God has revealed himself to us as an infinite being. God was there, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We see the Trinity in the very creation story from the very first of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, there's a beginning. There's a beginning right there. But God's already there in the beginning. So there's not a beginning to God. God is the, is the eternal being. Now I want to read this to you from Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. Now, Those three verses right there reveal to us the Trinity. Who is this God that we worship, that we pray to? He is the Creator. He is the Father. He is the essence of God. So it just uses the word God. In the Hebrew, it would have the word Elohim. Okay? Which Elohim in the Hebrew language is itself a plural word. It's not a singular name like Yahweh. It's a plural word. The form of it is plural. So, Elohim. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And then it goes on in in verse 2 and it says, And the Spirit of God, the Ruach, that's the Hebrew word, R-U-A-C-H, Ruach. That's the Spirit. It's the same word used in Genesis when it says that God created man from the clay of the earth, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And it's that same word, that ruach. Okay. So there's the Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is in creation. And so now we have the Trinity when we get to three. And God said, let there be light. God spoke. Nothing came into being without God's word. And we know from our study, a comprehensive study of Scripture, that the Word of God is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So, even in the beginning of Scripture, from the very first three verses, we have a Trinitarian revelation of God. 
as you, if you begin to read scripture this way, begin to really look at it for all it's worth and you begin to see, wow, God has been revealing himself over time in this Trinitarian form over and over and over again. The Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, the Father, it's all there. We can go fast forward to, fast forward to books like Daniel. In the book of the prophet Daniel, and it says that, you know, one of the most famous stories of Daniel is that the three youths, and they were thrown into the fiery furnace, right? And in the fiery furnace, it says, and there was one walking, a fourth one, as if walking around with them, as if the image of the Son of Man. Now, the Son of Man, who was that? That's a pre-incarnate, meaning before Jesus was born manifestation of God the Son, the Word of God. Son of Man. That's Jesus' favorite word for himself in the Gospels when he talks about himself, the Son of Man. Uh, So there's so many ways in which this whole God revealed in Trinity. Why do I bring up the Trinity tonight? Because we want to talk about prayer. Because I I want you to begin to think about who is God. This God we pray to. Okay, who is this God we pray to? Well, first of all, he is the infinite being, the the infinite being that exists in triune uh, unity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But when I say he's infinite, it means he's without beginning and without end. The Father's without beginning and without end. The Son is without beginning and without end. The Holy Spirit is without beginning and without end. Okay? This is why some of the ancient prayers always ended with this kind of a, uh, what do you call an ending of a something, not a, an epilogue or something. You know, the, 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 after the, in the ancient prayer services, after the reading of Psalms, they would always say a prayer that says, Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. It's called the Gloria Patri. How many have ever heard that before? You know, it's actually in the Nazarene hymnal. I never knew that. One day I was just thumbing through the back of the hymnal. Oh, wow. There. Didn't it know has, that was there. It has a musical melody to There's it. a musical melody to it, yeah. Now, the ancient Eastern Christians actually says, say it a little differently. They say, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. You hear me use that phrase a lot. I just like the way it flows. When you read about God in the book of Psalms, when you really begin to devour the book of Psalms, Psalms is where God really reveals himself and his character to us so much. And we see Christ all through the book of Psalms. And we see the Holy Spirit all through the book of Psalms. It's amazing when your eyes open up what you begin to see. And in these Psalms, God is constantly talks about uh, from everla- you are from everlasting to everlasting, the psalmist says. And some versions in the Old Septuagint said from age to age, or ages to ages, ages unto ages. So there's this idea that who is this God we're praying to? He's the infinite, eternal being. Okay? So how do you approach the infinite, eternal majesty of God in prayer? How should we approach the infinite, eternal majesty of God in prayer? What I want to spend a little bit of time with you on tonight, there are three, the three types of prayers, and we're not going to unlock them all three here tonight. We're just barely going to dip our foot in the water here. But I gave you these a couple of weeks ago. One form of prayer is petitionary prayer. That's the one where you make your request, your supplication, your list of things you need. Okay, that's your petition to God. The other is the intercessory prayer. That's where you're praying on behalf of others and for others, okay? You're interceding for them. The third is the contemplative form of prayer. This is the, of these three, we can't give, I, I don't want to give a pecking order to them that one is more important than the other. They all have their place. But the contemplative prayer is the one that we understand the least because we haven't trained ourselves and taught about it. What is contemplative prayer? Spend some time thinking about it. Spending time thinking about it. That's very good. 
It's the idea of Christian meditation. Contemplate it. Contemplate. Okay? So uh, what, I, what I'm telling you is there's actually a form of prayer in which you really just contemplate. Okay? And it leads you different places. It leads you deeper into God. It leads you deeper. May lead you, God may restart to reveal as you're contemplating. He may reveal something new to you. But if all we ever think of prayer as is our talking to God about our needs, then we are, uh, uh, this is going to sound a little controversial, okay? We're wasting our time. And I wouldn't say we're wasting God's time, but God's not worried about that because He's eternal. Okay? <laughs> because God knows what we need before we even think it. Okay? So, have you ever been in one of those situations where you just, you felt like you just couldn't find the right words to pray? You just, you wanted, or, or how about this one? You said something to God and you go, oh God, that's just not quite what I meant to say. I wish I'd have said it differently. I mean this, or you tag that. I mean, I may be the only lunatic that does this from time to time, but I, I, I think this way from time to time. And then I realize, the Father knows what I meant before I even said it. Well, if that's true, then why do we need to say it? Because, let me refer you back to point number one, God hears our prayers before the world was ever formed, and he used those prayers to take into the wisdom of his counsel to create his plan, his providential plan for the whole world. And if we never prayed them, he, they were never there for him to hear. I'll just keep coming back to that because that is revolutionary in the way we begin to approach this wonderful, infinite, majestic God in prayer. Now, I'm going to tell you tonight what I think the goal of the Christian life is. Okay, if I were to ask you, what do you think the goal of the Christian life is? How might you answer that question? What are some thoughts you might throw out? All these notes on the board are from my Thursday morning class, so you don't need to worry about those. To get myself and as many others to heaven. Okay, to get myself and as many others to heaven. Okay. What else? To know God's will. Anything else? Let me get let me get you let me get you one step further. If you look on your notes, the first answer there is to know God's will, exactly what you said, Sylvia, to know God's will. But the second answer I'm going to give you, and I would say, Polly, your answer is probably the the answer that would be given by most evangelical Christians. We're trained to think that way. We want to get to heaven, and we want to make sure everybody else we can get to heaven too. And there's yes. nothing wrong with that. Uh, synonymous with a Christian life. I mean, to, to yeah. qualify. Yes, <laughs> but it's just it's. But 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 let me say that if that's the only way we approach it, if we think in that mindset all the time, the challenge is we put the cart before the horse, to use an old proverb, because what we're trying, we don't. We haven't fully comprehended, not that we could ever fully comprehend, but we haven't learned to really comprehend the relationship with our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we not only can have, but that He desires for us to have. And that's the ultimate reason for heaven. Mm -hmm. You see, heaven, the ultimate reason for heaven and to make it to heaven is not to avoid hell. It's to be united with the lover of our soul. It's to be re recreated. Okay? It's not just out of fear. That's, a, that's kind of a, uh, an entrance for many people to the walk of a, a Christian life. Just don't want to go to hell. Uh, but, it's, but we don't want to stay there. That's spiritual kindergarten. Okay? We want to grow to the place where we come to the answer that's number two. And number two on here is not just to know God's will, but to be God's will. To be God's will. Now, what do I mean by that? I want to share with you a devotion today. This was actually today's devotion from Oswald Chambers. 
God just aligned the stars for us here. Today's devotion was this thought that I plan to bring up in class. You're going to love this, I think. This is called Friendship with God for March the 20th from the book My Utmost for His Highest. Classic devotional book written in 18 maybe, I'm sorry. Yeah, the author died in 1917. When did he write it? Um, And if you've never read it, I really highly recommend that you read it in your life. Uh, You can't even find the original printing here. It's so old. It's in the 1800s. Classic, still being reproduced today. Friendship with God. He uses the analogy of Abraham and his relationship with God. So we want to think about Abraham and his relationship with God. Now think about Abraham for a minute, you know, and compare your relationship to Abraham's relationship. Abraham was born a pagan in a pagan land where the only thing they knew about gods were they were stone idols, okay? But yet he hears a voice, a a, a calling to his life from the God of the universe, Yahweh. And Abraham responds to that with no church around, no guiding light, no Bible, other than just the Spirit of God calling out to him. And he responds in amazing obedience, So much so, the scripture calls him a friend of God. Now, Oswald Chambers in his devotional today talks about the delights of the friendship with God and the difficulties of friendship with God. So let's talk about the delights first. And he uses Genesis chapter 18. And Genesis chapter 18 is the story where the, the, the three men come walking up to Abraham's tent And it tells us that one of them is like the angel of the Lord. Now, whenever you see that in Scripture, again, this is like the Son of Man in the furnace. This is God. It's called a theophany, an appearance of God. Okay? So, in this case, theo, from the Greek word for God, and ophany, meaning to appear. Okay? So, it's a theophany, just like this image of the Son of Man in the fiery furnace. The angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate though, okay? So, it's a mystery, guys. It's a very deep mystery how God does this. We can't even begin to understand how God does it, or the full implications of what it means. But that's the story, and you'll remember that they came up, and that's when they tell him that Sarah's going to have a baby, and Sarah's in the tent fixing him food because he knows that he wants them to stay and eat with him and everything. Uh, but it, here he goes on. He says, now Genesis 18 brings out the delight of true friendship with God as compared with, the, with simply feeling his presence occasionally in prayer. Now, I'm gonna, this is where we're going today. There is such a thing as occasionally feeling God's presence in prayer, and there's such a thing as true friendship with God. He's going to use Abraham for the example. So this friendship with God means being so intimately in touch with God that you never even need to ask him to show you his will. Let that soak in for a minute. So intimately in touch with God that you don't even need to ask him to show you his will. It's it's evidence of a level of intimacy which confirms that you are nearing the final stage of your discipline in the life of faith. When you have a right standing relationship with God, you have a life of freedom, liberty, and delight. You are God's will. Hear that are? That's that verb to be, you know, you are God's will. And all of your common sense decisions are actually His will for you. Unless you sense a feeling of restraint brought on by a check in the spirit. You are free to make decisions in light of the perfect, delightful friendship with God. Knowing that if your decisions are wrong, he will lovingly produce that sense of restraint. And once he does that, you must stop immediately. Do you hear what's being described here? There is a life walking with God that is being described by Oswald here that is so intimately united with God in this world, not in the next, in this world, that we are his will and we know his will 
and we do His will. And our, it's common sense to us. And He guides us. And if we start to do think, if, if it's ever not His will, we're so in tune with Him, the check of His Holy Spirit marks us and we stop. I mean, this is, this is the goal of the Christian life. That's where we want to be. Now, I'm not teaching this class because I'm there. I want to be there. I'm not. Hope to be someday. But you see the difference between a Christian, pursuing a Christian life with that goal in mind, or just pursuing a Christian life that says, I just got to make sure I don't go to hell. Friendship with God, with the creator of your soul, with the creator of the universe. Now, the difficulties of being friends with God. Uh, Oswald writes. He says, why did Abraham stop praying when he did? Now, I had to delve into that a little bit because in that, in that chapter, it doesn't really say that Abraham stopped praying. So we kind of ask the question, what in the world does he mean by that? When, when, why did Abraham stop praying when he did? Because he goes on to say, he stopped because he still was lacking the level of intimacy in his relationship with God, which would enable him to boldly continue on with the Lord in prayer until his desire was granted. And as I did a little research, I thought, you know, I think what he means, what Oswald, I can't ask him, he's been dead for a hundred years, but I think what he meant by that was when Abraham stopped believing that God would answer us, why did he stop asking God would answer his prayer? You know, remember what the prayer of Abraham's heart was, him and Sarah's prayer was, the prayer of their heart was to have children. You know, that was to have an heir. And then God came to him and promised him he would have an heir and promised him it would be you know, as numerous as the sands of the seashore and then left him out there another 25 years without any answer to that prayer. There was a point where Abraham just stopped praying. He didn't necessarily stop believing in God, of course, but he stopped praying. It's difficult. It's difficult. We cannot look at Abraham's life and say, wow, that, would, you know, that was easy. No, not at all. So he goes on to say, he says, whenever we stop short, this is where I think it applies to us, whenever we stop short of our true desire in prayer, and we say, quote, well, I don't know, maybe this is not God's will. Those are haunting words to me. I've said that so many times. Well, maybe this is not God's will. When we stop short of our true desire in prayer and we say, well, I don't know, maybe this is not God's will, then we still know that we still have another level to go. It shows that we are not as intimately acquainted with God as Jesus was. And get this, and as Jesus would have us to be. You say, well, I, know, I want you to think now, does Jesus want you to be so intimate with him with our God that you would not stop short. You just know you are His will. Okay? You be His will. Would He? How do we know that Jesus wants that and desires us? Well, listen to the Gospel of John chapter 17. Let's go to the Gospel of John chapter 17. That's the prayer of Jesus when He is the last night of His life, His high priestly prayer. Listen to some of these words of Jesus. He's, he's praying all through that. It's a long chair. It's the longest, uh, it's the longest recorded uh, sayings of Jesus that we have anywhere. And he, he's, uh, without reading the whole thing to you, he's talking about, you know, I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, meaning his apostles. Uh, I'm on my way to you, Father, but I want you to keep them in, in your name, in your holy name, the name that I've given them while I've been here with them. And, and then he comes to uh, verse 15, he says, verse 14, he says, Jesus saying, this is Jesus praying to the Father. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. 
And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. And here's where it gets really, really good. This is the point I want you to hear. I'm not asking this, Jesus says. I do not ask for these only. Meaning Peter, James, John, Thomas, you know, Andrew, all of those that are there. I do not ask for these only, but for all those who will believe in me through their word. That they may all be one, just as you and I are one. Wow. That's amazing. Now, the glory goes on. Jesus goes on. The glory that you have sent me, the glory that you have given me, I'm sorry. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. Do you hear the relationship that Jesus Christ calls us to. He calls and desires us, not just Peter, James, and John, us, 2,000 years later. He's calling us to be so perfectly one with Him, just like He is one with the Father. There is a mystical union that the human creation is called to have with His or her Creator. And that only happens through prayer. Prayer in its highest form. Prayer in its highest form. And and we can't even describe what that is. Okay? No teacher could stand here and describe to you what prayer in its highest form is like. We just know when it happens. We know when it happens. Maybe somebody in this class has, has felt a time where God just washed over you. And you felt... So united with him in a moment of prayer. In an ang- maybe it was in anguish. Maybe it was in ecstasy. But God just washed over you and his spirit just fell upon you. That is our goal in life. To be God's will. To know him so intimately that we don't even even have to ask. We just we move. When Peter, James, and John walked up to the temple that day, after the resurrection, after Pentecost, and the beggar asked them for money, they didn't stop and say, let's pray and discern if this is God's will. In fact, nowhere in the book of the Acts do the apostles ever stop and say, oh God, show us your will. Should we heal this man or not? Should we do this or not? They just act. And and we're tempted to say, well, they were apostles. (laughs) They were with Jesus. But what did John just tell us in 17? That's the life he calls us to. Wow. That's so exciting to me. So, I put the little quote there on your paper. The delight of true friendship with God as compared to simply feeling his presence occasionally in prayer. This friendship means being so intimately in touch with God that you never have to ask him to show you his will. You are God's will. Well, I put that in there because I want it to just soak in for you for a while. Let me finish Oswald's thoughts here. He says, think of the last thing you prayed about. Think of the last thing you prayed about. In a little bit, in a few minutes, we're going to do a, 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 a little prayer experience here. But right now I'm asking you to just think about the last thing that you prayed about. Were you devoted to your desire Or were you devoted to God? Was your determination to get some gift of the Spirit for yourself? Or to get to God? And he quotes Matthew 6, 8. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. The reason for asking is so you may get to know God better. Delight yourself also in the Lord, the psalmist says in Psalm 34. And then he shall give you the desires of your heart. You catch that? That's Psalm 34, 7. Delight yourself in the desires of the Lord. And then he will give you the desires of your heart. To delight in the Lord. He said we should keep praying to get 
a perfect understanding of God himself. That's his last word on today's devotion. We should keep praying in order to get a perfect understanding of God himself. So my question to you tonight in the beginning of this class was, who is this God that we pray to? Do we really know him? He is our God. He is our Savior. We're part of his church. We love him. Maybe we love him with a divided heart. Maybe we love him with a whole heart. But that, even that, I hope it's a whole heart, but even that is a continuing work. Because there's more of me to experience every moment that I live. And there's more of me to surrender every moment that I live. It's a continuing pursuit of God in his, in his beauty and in his vision and his, in his holiness. I want to give you a thought here. Um, at the bottom page of the first page, it says, to attain to such a blessed state. I'm calling this a blessed state. I mean, the, the union with God that I'm describing just sounds euphoric. It sounds, wow. It sounds otherworldly. It sounds, it might sound, you might be thinking... That sounds like it's for those people that sit in the monastery and pray all day, you know, not me that lives life in the real world. But, but yet it is. It's for us. It's for everyone. And, and I want to talk a little bit about that. We must realize uh, that prayer is a relationship to, this is the first thing we have to realize. We must realize that prayer is a relationship to be lived, not a tool to be used. So whether we're going to talk about petitionary prayer or whether we're going to talk about intercessory prayer or whether we're going to talk about just contemplative prayer whatever prayer we pray it is we must first realize that it's about relationship not a tool to be used now to back that up a little bit I want to share some thoughts with you from uh, one of my favorite books uh, beginning to pray by Anthony Bloom um, I mentioned him the first week uh, or the second week. I can't remember which. But listen to some of these thoughts on this idea of relationship with God. Anthony Bloom said something. He wrote this book and he, he bases this book on the thought, this thought, that real prayer begins when we experience the absence of God. That's, that's a mind-blowing thought. So we're, gonna, we're just going to put it out there and put it on a shelf and see if we can figure it out over time. What does he mean by that? He does not mean, he says right here, um, now I don't mean, he says, as we start learning to pray, I'd like to make it clear that what I mean by learning to pray is not an attempt to just justify or explain any speculative way. Um, he said, at the outset, there is, uh, there is then one very important problem. The situation of one for whom God seems to be absent. This is what I want to now speak about. Obviously, he says, I'm not speaking about a real absence. God is never really absent. But of the sense of absence, which we have. Now, I want to direct you back to the list I made from your cards of the first week of the questions you had about prayer or life of prayer. And almost without fail, I was 15 or 16 of them we listed here, almost without fail, every one of them testified. And they were, they were anonymous. I don't know who wrote them or anything. I took a picture of it, but I don't have time to pull it up and read it to you. But almost every one of them sensed an absence of God. Does God really hear my prayer? How can I be sure to know he, he hears my prayer? Uh, why aren't my prayers answered? Every one of them were questions. Natural human questions. And this is what Anthony's saying is, he's saying we must begin at that place where we sense the absence of God. And this is why that's so important. <clears throat> he says, first of all, it is very important to remember that prayer is an encounter and a relationship. It's an encounter and a relationship. And this relationship cannot be forced either on us or on God. You get that? The fact that God can make himself present or can leave us with a sense of his absence is a part of this live and real relationship. I love this. This is powerful. If we could mechanically draw God into an encounter, force him to meet with us, simply because we've chosen this moment to meet with him, there would be no relationship, no encounter. 
We can do that with an image. We can do that with an imagination or with various idols we put in front of us instead of God. But we can do nothing of the sort with the living God. Any more than we can do it with a living person. Think about that. We can't force your presence. I mean, and even if I do force your presence physically, I have no relationship with you. That means now you're really mad at me and you hate me or something, you know. Um, you're not really present. So, trying to open our mind up to how do, my opening question tonight, who is this God that we are to approach in prayer? We, I, am so guilty over my lifetime of not understanding this relationship. I, you know, I know there's a sense in which our children, we love our children so much, we've taught them. You can come to mom and dad anytime. You can just come to us anytime. And I know God called, we call him father, and I've heard the great sermons about we can just run to our father's lap. And, and all of that's true. But yet at the same time, are we appreciating who God is and who we are in relationship with him? Or are we taking that relationship for granted by just thinking we can get him to answer our prayer whenever we want him to? Or just thinking we can meet him whenever we want to. So he begins to ask the question, what does it mean to meet with God? What does it mean to meet God? He said, you can think a little bit about the scriptures. Uh, many scriptures in the Bible talk about this face-to-face -face idea with God, and it's usually quite an ordeal of judgment. It's quite an ordeal of judgment. Uh, we, we cannot meet God in prayer. He says we cannot meet God in prayer or in meditation or contemplation and not be either saved or condemned. Saved or condemned. Okay, let me explain what he meant by that. He says, I do not mean in the major terms of eternal damnation or eternal salvation, which is already being given and received. He says, but what I mean by that is that in every meeting with God, it is always a crisis moment. The word crisis comes from the Greek word, which means judgment. To meet God face to face in prayer is a critical moment in our lives. And thanks be to God that he does not always present himself to us when we wish to meet him. Because we might not be able to endure such a meeting. Remember the many passages of scripture in which we are told how bad it is to find oneself face to face with God because God is power and God is truth and God is purity. And therefore, the first thought we ought to have when we do not tangibly perceive his divine presence, when we're, just, when we're tangibly perceiving that he's absent, the first thought we ought to have then is a thought of gratitude. God is merciful. He does not come in an untimely way. He gives us a chance to judge ourselves, to understand and to not come into his presence at a moment when it would mean condemnation. That's a powerful, powerful passage that we want to stop and think about for a minute. Now I want to, I want to do an, a, a little prayer experience with you here, okay? So I want you to put down your pens and your pencils and I want you to you can close your eyes, probably work better. I know we have to zone out a little. There's an audio tape in the room next to us, and there's some maybe people in the hallway a little bit. It's hard to get perfect quiet to contemplate on things. But I want you to think of something that your heart longs for God to answer. So I want you to take a few moments, and I want you to think. Perhaps it's the greatest prayer desire of your life it's just the greatest petitionary prayer you still don't believe has been answered you don't know the answer you're, you're yearning for God to answer it think of it your heart longs for God to answer it your greatest need request something that matters more to you that God answers it than any other prayer you could give him now I want you to spend a few moments praying about that. Just talk to God. Talk to God about it.
What do you sense? What do you sense from God? In your trying to yearn to Him, what do you sense in this moment? Do you sense His presence? Do you sense His hearing you? Or do you sense perhaps His absence? Or do you sense, Brad, all I can hear is that audio tape in the other room. (laughs) You see, what do we sense when we come to God with the deepest longings of our heart? Anybody want to share something you're sensing from God? You don't have to, but if you do, you're welcome to. There's no right or wrong answer. I feel a hug. I just feel, okay. I feel a physical presence when I. Beautiful. It just Beautiful. feels comfortable. Even with the distractions. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. I have six grandkids. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. I love it. Hmm, that's beautiful. Now, I want you to try another experience with me. I want you to clear your mind of that. Clear your mind of that request. Okay. I want you to think of another request. Not so dire, not so important. Not so dire, not so important. Just something you, you, you kind of been meaning to ask God something you've been maybe meaning to bring to him it's it's not the end of the world it's not your dearest most needed desire think about that for a little bit just just quiet yourself and pray about that for a few minutes whatever it is So as you think about this second request, do you sense anything different? Is the sense that you experience in your prayer sense, the sensory reception of God, any different? The human experience, no two people would ever answer exactly the same, but it's not uncommon for us to feel something different. It just feels different. It just does. I don't know why. It just does. But Anthony Bloom's going to give us a thought on why it maybe feels different. So listen to this. Let us think of our prayers, yours and mine. Think of the warmth, the depth, the intensity of your prayer when it concerns someone you love or something that matters to your life. Then your heart is open. All your inner self is recollected in the prayer. Does it mean that God matters to you? No, it does not. It simply means that the subject matter of your prayer matters to you dearly. For when you have made your passionate, deep, intense prayer concerning the person you love or the situation that worries you, and you turn to the next item, which does not matter so much, if you suddenly grow cold or feel an absence or just different, what, what has changed? What has changed? Has God grown cold? Has he gone? No. It means that all the elation and the intensity in your prayer was not born of God's presence, but of your faith in Him, of your longing for Him, of your awareness of Him. And it was born of nothing more than your concern for Him or her, not, uh, or it, not for God. How can we feel surprised then that this absence of God affects us? It is we who make ourselves absent. It is we who grow cold the moment we are no longer concerned at the same level. Why? Because, this is difficult to hear, 
Because he, meaning God, does not matter so much. Ouch. It's difficult to hear. It's very difficult to hear. But what he's basically saying is, do we approach God with the same expectancy and intensity for everything in our lives? Do we come to him in that same longing for him? And I put it on your notes here. I said, do we want him or do we want something from him? That's what it all boils down to. Now you're beginning to pray. Okay, the title of the book, Beginning to Pray. Now you're beginning to pray when you realize the difference between wanting Him and wanting something from Him. Let me remind you of my earlier statement. Prayer is about relationship. To be lived, not a tool to be used. What would it look like? What would our lives look like? What would our world look like? What would our, if, if our prayers were in desire of Him, knowing that when we are truly friends with Him, when we truly walk with Him, as maybe Enoch did, whom it says walked so closely with God that God just took him. That when we, when we are truly in this experience with God, what would our world look like? What would our prayers look like? Rather than just thinking, however good-hearted we may mean it, that we can just bring it to God whenever we want to, whether it's the right time for our heart being prepared for God or not. He says, I don't know if I can find it on another page here. Um, there is... Uh, There is the thought that um, we complain sometimes that God doesn't answer our prayers. I know maybe not the three of us or the four of us or whoever's in this class, but, but that's real. That's a real complaint. People say, I don't understand why God doesn't answer my prayers. So we complain about God being absent. I don't think God hears me. How do I really know? You know, these thoughts like we had on our board are questions. When, in reality, if you take the... We live in time and space. We have 24 hours a day, right? Every single one of us has 24 hours a day. Not a second more, not a second less. It's all about how we use those 24 hours. And yet we come to God at our demand, not at His. And we demand to hear our prayers. And oh, by the way, answer this and this and this. And maybe five minutes, ten minutes, thirty minutes. But what if God's desire for that prayer was at a different time? What if God's desire was to hear from his children more often? What kind of relationship is there when we just go to them when only we want something from them? If your child did that for you, you would feel used by them. If your husband or your wife did that for you, to you, you would feel used by them, not loved by them. Now we're beginning to pray when we realize that God wants to be in relationship with us 24-7, 365 days a year. There's an old saying that says absence makes the heart grow fonder. When we sense that God is absent, it should draw our hearts ever fonder towards Him. Because then we realize we're beginning to really pray. We're beginning to really focus and realize maybe I wasn't in the right place. Maybe it was me that's moved. Maybe it's me that wasn't. It's not that God changed. So, you know, if, you're, if you think about being away from your spouse or your loved ones for periods of time, you always carry them in your heart, don't you? You do. Even when you get busy, you, get, you think about them. They come across your heart and mind. They do mine. I know they do. How about our loved ones who have died and gone to heaven? We're physically not with them. 
But we're still, when we carry them in our heart, we're still united with them. There's a bond that cannot be broken, and that bond is a spiritual bond. Physical bonds can be broken. Spiritual bonds, the spiritual bonds that are born of God, we have no power to break. We can walk away from them. We have the power to walk away from them because He's made us free. But we have no power to break them. So there's so much more that I would like to say to you. I'm out of time for tonight. Um, we did get through the two pages of notes, although it wasn't a whole lot there. Um, what thoughts do you have after this little experience we have done tonight? This prayer experience. Any thoughts? Anybody want to share anything? Surely was an absence. And I don't know if that's the distractions or what, but yeah. the focus isn't there. Yeah. Yeah. At yeah. this time. Yeah. I had another part I wanted to read. I'm going to really see if I can find it here. Well, yes. You know, I, I, wanna, I want you to hear something here. Um, Peter, uh, in, the, in the scripture, I, Anthony Bloom's going to show us one last thing here before we close, because it deals with that tongue to love him and that, that, that approach to love God rightly. And he says, Peter in his boat, take Peter in his boat after the great catch of fish. Do you remember that? After the, you know, the great catch and... It says Peter fell on his knees and he said, does anybody remember what he said? He said, leave me, O Lord, for I am a sinner. Mm. Jesus does this amazing thing to prove his love for Peter, you know, and, and, and Peter just falls down and says, leave me, O Lord, for I'm a sinner. Yeah. He asked the Lord to leave his boat because he felt so humbled. And he felt humbled because he suddenly perceived the greatness of Jesus. Do we ever do that? He asked, the, Anthony Bloom asked the question, do we ever do that? Ask God to leave us? To feel his greatness to the point that we would say, I'm not worthy to be in your presence, God. Do we do that? Listen to how he goes on. He says, when we read the gospel, and the image of Christ becomes so compelling, so glorious. And when we pray and we become aware of the greatness, the holiness of God, do we ever say, quote, I'm unworthy that he should come near me? Not to speak of all occasions when we should be aware of it, that he cannot come to us because we are not there to receive him. That's, that's a challenging yeah, sorry, thought. Yeah, no, it's a challenging thought. Do we ever say, I am unworthy that he, meaning God, should come near me? Mm -hmm. Not to speak of all the occasions when we should be aware that he cannot come to us because we are not there to receive him. We're not even thinking about him. We're not even aware of his presence when he's right there with us. He, he'll go on to flesh it out a little. He says, we want something from him, not him. Is that a relationship? Do we behave in that way with our friends? I've talked about it with our spouses, the ones we love. Do we aim at what friendship can give us, or is it the friend whom we love? And is that true with regard to Jesus? That is the question our souls must ask. If we really want to learn to pray and unlock the mysteries of prayer, and to pray, as the Apostle Paul says, without ceasing, and to understand this glorious work that God has given us that is, that is just so free and so filling, that is, as we learned last week, that is what he's built his whole world upon. How important is prayer? It's ultimately important. He's built the foundations of the world in his providential plan on the prayers of his people, knowing what we will do and what we won't do. How much do we love him? So I think the challenge I want to leave you with tonight, because I'm out of time, is, uh, is this thought. Practice his presence. Practice his presence as you go through this week until we meet next time. We will talk more about, we'll, we'll, we'll actually dive into petitionary prayer. I think we're ready. I had to get through these two lessons on 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 why and why should we pray and who is this God we pray to. 
Um, and we'll talk more about what our petitions mean in that next time we gather. But I want to leave you with this thought of being in his presence 24-7, 365 days a year. Are you available to him? Or are you too busy to hear him? No matter where you're going, no matter what you're doing. He's calling. He wants to be with us in everything we do. So uh, just practice the presence of God. And as you pray, practice some of those thoughts, like this idea of uh, when you're praying, be aware of, well, all of a sudden it felt different. I was so moved that God was with me as I tried to get that one, but then he didn't seem to be as with me. Maybe that's a signal that we're wanting and desiring with wrong motives. Jesus says this. Remember, Jesus says this. You have not because you ask with wrong motives. That's what Jesus says. You have not because you ask with wrong motives. He says, ask whatever you will in my name and it will be done for you. But you have not because you ask with wrong motives. Our whole goal in this class is to enlighten us to the thought that there is an experience, there is a walk with God that is so close that we be his will not have to ask what his will is. So this doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen over it, a lifetime. Sometimes it never happens. I mean, we, we will never graduate unless I guess we're Enoch. <laughs> unless we just, so one day God just takes us, huh? Um, but that's our goal. What's, what do you set your sights on? The life, the spirit-filled life, the life of prayer. Well, let's pray as we close together. Lord, let us depart in peace, knowing that we have seen you, our almighty Father, high and lifted up in our time together tonight. We've been drawn by your presence. We have opened our hearts to be challenged by your presence. We invite you now to go with us, reminding us of your presence always with us, that you are everywhere and filling all things, and you are the giver of all good gifts. So thank you, Father for the gift of your presence. Be with us now until we meet again as we pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. This has been Forming the Spirit Within. I'm Roger Culver, inviting you to tune in next time as Pastor Brad opens God's Word, helping us to form the Holy Spirit within us. Until then, may grace and peace be with you.